The following program is brought to you by Coronavirus and the newest in the beta coronavirus line, COVID-19. Coronavirus, bringing human misery for 8,000 years. And by the state of Wisconsin's prohibition on gatherings of more than 10 people. Wisconsin, forward. And by the faculty and staff of Lawrence University. Welcome back to Historic Preservation. We are on Lecture 11, and today we're going to be talking about economics and sustainability. We're going to begin talking about the basic economics of historic preservation, and one of the issues that comes up in anything, but certainly in historic preservation, is how do you pay for it? What's it going to cost? So we're going to look at some of the basic features that, that create issues with paying for historic preservation. One of the fundamental problems in terms of historic preservation is that it is cheaper to build new most of the time. And because it is cheaper to build new, there isn't a lot of desire or pressure or motivation for builders to repurpose a building when they can build something new. On the other hand, for a community, it's far cheaper to have buildings repurposed than it is to have buildings built new, either tearing down a building and building from scratch or building out further from the city or on empty lots uh, outside of the city. Resolving those issues is really the core of historic preservation economics. And in fact, becomes the core of historic preservation sustainability. Because as we'll find out, the most sustainable building is the one that's already built. So the way that this conflict between new building and repurposing tends to get uh, addressed is through tax incentives. And so I want to go through some of those. But before I do, I want to illustrate why building new is actually cheaper. Because you would think that taking a building that's there already, gutting the interior, putting a new interior in, is going to be cheaper than tearing the whole thing down and building up. But there's a lot of efficiencies that come into building new, and one of them is you can do much more efficient scheduling. When you build new, you are starting with essentially a blank slate. Construction company knows how long it will take to do particular tasks. The architect will have laid out many of the things that are special or unique that have to be done. And so a, a, a construction firm can lay those tasks out very clearly and bring people in on days when they know those tasks have to be done. What that means is that you hire an electrician to come in. They have the work to do, they do it and they leave. You don't have them there waiting for a, a day or fiddling around doing things until something's ready and then staying on a couple of days uh, fiddling with things until they solve whatever problems there are. You're ordering concrete. You know, the forms will be in on such and such a date. You order it all for that date. It comes, you finish it. It's just much more efficient, much more cost effective, particularly in labor costs. And so that's a really important piece of building new. Another really important piece of building new is that a lot of stuff can be done off site. You can get prefabricated concrete flooring or concrete pillars. You can have the steel prefabricated. You can design your building around standard lengths so that you can just order them and they come. So that is cost effective and makes, again, scheduling very easy. You're starting from scratch so you can build based on materials you know are readily available and that are already dimensioned or that you can 
have constructed off-site, brought in, and put up quickly. A third reason is that there are fewer, I say few here, but there are fewer surprises when you're building new. One of the issues with repurposing a building is that you are always running into surprises. You never know what's behind the wall. You pull down the wall and you find out that someone had had a window in there before and that there isn't structural support that you need. So then you gotta go back and you gotta order a beam and it's gonna take two weeks so your schedule is all messed up. That's the nature of repurposing buildings. The new construction, pretty much everything is there. There are a few surprises. There are always gonna be some surprises. But there's fewer surprises. In repurposing a building, you're going to have a surprise that's gonna be a new cost to you every day. In new construction, every week maybe every month. And that really saves time, and time is money. It saves on having to order things, and it saves just on you don't have to fix those surprises. And being able to efficiently schedule, to have things built off-site or come already dimensioned, not having to deal with surprises, all that means labor costs are far less. All of this really, this efficiency lowers labor costs. And the labor costs are what are really expensive. Um, materials costs are also expensive, but again with new construction you can buy in bulk, you can pre-order, you can obtain stuff that is pre-dimensioned, and so you can cut those costs, but you're having to build more. You're having to build the, the exterior of the building and, and all of the pieces of it. So those get balanced off where the difference really comes is labor costs. Why for a community then is repurposing better? You think that, okay, the labor costs are low, you get these nice new buildings, they're going to attract people to the nice new buildings, everything's up to code. Why is repurposing better for a community? Well, one of the key pieces is that there's no new infrastructure needed. If you take an existing building, you already have water lines and sewer lines going to it. You already have streets. You already have police and fire stations somewhere nearby that can cover that building. If you build new, that may not be the case. If you tear down a building and build on the site, maybe you'll have that situation but you may have to upgrade some of the infrastructure too for that purpose. When you're building out, spreading the community out into the suburbs, you're having to build new streets, put in new sewers, put in new water lines, new fire hydrants, maybe build a new fire station for the people that are far out there. It creates a lot of costs and that is tax dollars. Usually pre, uh, repurposing is overall easier for the city to deal with in terms of uh, planning and permitting and zoning. New construction, they often want deals. They need to have zoning change slightly. They need to go through planning commission. They have to have neighborhood conversations about this new building, about they have to go through the 106 process because they're gonna do a tear down and a rebuilding well, depending on the structure. Uh, so it actually, for the community, is much easier uh, in terms of staff time and committee time uh, to repurpose a building. And time is money. And there we go. You get to, when you're repurposing a building, that allows you to revitalize an older community. And that revitalization brings in tax dollars. If you have a new building that is attractive, provides higher rents for office space or for apartments, that's gonna bring in more tax dollars. You're taking a building that's worth a million, putting a lot of money into it, now it's worth three million, it's more tax dollars. You have office space, in addition to those nice new tax dollars on the million dollar becoming a three million dollar building, you have a hundred new workers downtown and they're going out and having lunch. 
you're bringing businesses downtown, you're bringing in tax revenues, and all that is good. New tax revenue. One of the key pieces, though, and I think this cannot be um, understated, has to do with labor costs. When you're building new, the labor sometimes comes from far away. You've got people that are pre-building things, come in with their own people and put it in. In addition to that though, and much more important, is that when you're repurposing a building, a lot of the costs are labor costs because there are lots of surprises. You've got open, open a wall and find a pipe that is about to rust out and burst. You've got to bring in a plumber. That's going to be a local plumber. You have new cabinetry that needs to go in. You're going to have local cabinet makers doing that. You need to have new floors put in the bathrooms, tiled, grouted. You're going to have local people doing all that. The labor really stays local. You're not paying for labor off somewhere to build your wall panels, to build your pre-poured concrete flooring, uh, to, to build the bricks that are going to go in the facade. Those are already there, and all of the labor really is local labor of the tradesmen that are in the community. And that, again, is really good for the community. It provides jobs, provides income, and all that provides revenue for the community and keeps the community going. So, it really is better for a community to repurpose buildings than to uh, construct new. And, and so there is this conflict between the developers who are in it to make money and have to keep costs low, and the community that wants to revitalize their community, employ people locally, and raise revenue. And so the way that that gets taken care of is through taxes. We'll take a short break, come back, talk about taxes. And now, gratuitous violence. Hold the lever, Crunk. Roll the lever! Why do we even have that lever? And we are back. So we're going to talk about taxes and the incentives that are used to balance this conflict between developers and communities in terms of repurposing buildings. One of the ways that local communities can help developers pay for repurposing is by what's called an abatement. Abatements are fairly dramatic. They essentially say you don't have to pay tax on this property for a certain number of years. We're going to cancel it. It can be a percentage, but it typically is an incentive that says no taxes, repurpose this building, you're going to save a lot of money over the next five years, ten years in terms of taxes. More commonly is something called tax incremental financing or TIF. TIFs are sort of like mortgaging taxes in that you are using other properties, you, you put a little bit higher tax on other properties in, a, in some area that is being redeveloped. You want to have this building repurposed. The neighbors around it in the community pay a little bit more in tax. They pay the taxes on that building while it's being constructed and for some period of time afterwards. And then once that building starts paying its own taxes, in theory, the tax, the extra taxes that have been paid by all the other ones go back through tax cuts or through other benefits. So it's kind of, I like to think of it as mortgaging the taxes on a building till they get paid back in the future. This is used all over the place. It's a very effective way to encourage development, to encourage uh, repurposing of historic properties. Uh, TIFs are used to uh, to help to restore entire neighborhoods. Um, the, the kinds of projects where we have like Fox River Mills, I don't know how that was financed, but I know in this area, large um, factory complexes 
are being turned into mixed use uh, shopping and residential and office developments through TIFs. It's very effective, very attractive to the developers, attractive to the banks who are funding this, attractive to the communities, and usually very attractive to the businesses that are paying the TIF funds because they know it's going to increase their business and everyone will end up being off in a few years. Being off, being better off in a few years. Um, while these two tax abatements and TIFs are typically local, almost always local, although there are some state programs like that, tax credits have become the real meat for historic preservation specifically. And they are available at local, state, and federal levels. There are local uh, tax credits for remodeling, rebuilding, repurposing um, uh, historic structures. There are state programs of tax credits. And there is several large federal programs uh, that provide tax credits to businesses that want to repurpose or restore buildings. State and federal credits typically are not for individuals, and neither would be abatements or TIFs. However, tax credits in some localities do apply to, to personal houses. And here at Appleton, while we don't have a tax credit, we do have monetary incentives. Uh, and we have really very generous state tax credits for businesses that want to um, repurpose buildings, uh, renovate, remodel. Um, and we do have some local uh, uh, or some state for individual owners who want to make particular repairs like to roofs or to put in um, more sustainable uh, windows, efficient things. That, that provide you know, a variety of little bits and pieces here for the ability to, uh, to maintain or improve an historic house that they themselves live in. But again, primarily these are for businesses. Um, but there's a wide variety of those, again, at the local, state, and federal level. And one of the things that to note is that regardless of where they're coming from, but absolutely at the state and federal level, secretary standards apply. So the control that is on the tax incentive saying, I want these tax incentives and I am going to repurpose this building or reconstruct this building and I am going to keep it historically uh, accurate so I'm doing historic preservation. The way that that's controlled is through the secretary standards. And if you don't meet the secretary's standards, you don't get the credit. One of the other sort of issues with the tax credits or the tax incentives is that usually, if you get an abatement, you get a TIF financing, you get some other kind of state or federal tax credit, and you do the remodeling or the reconstruction or uh, whatever, up to the secretary's standards, if you then later change and go away from the secretary's standards, you have to pay the credits back. Now that's really good for the community. It's not necessarily bad for a homeowner, or it's not necessarily good for a business or a homeowner who has who has gotten historic preservation credits and then 10 years down the road wants to put a change some part of the facade. Uh, they have to pay them all back. That's kind of an issue, but it's the way that you maintain integrity. Uh, by maintaining, you have to meet and continue to meet the secretary's standards. There are also a wide variety of preservation grants out there, and I'm just going to talk about a few of them. These are direct funds given to developers and sometimes to private holders and to communities for historic preservation. Um, 
One of the kinds of grants that is used widely for historic preservation are low-income housing grants, often from Housing and Urban Development, HUD, to take a, an older building, repurpose it from a factory into apartments, or from a, a large house into a series of smaller apartments for low-income housing. It's a very effective use of, of buildings. It's a great incentive to create low-income housing, and it has worked very effectively. This often is done by nonprofits uh, in communities, and by working through HUD and being nonprofits, they not only get the preservation grants, but because they're nonprofits, they don't have to pay taxes. So it can be a very efficient and economical way to transform old uh, factories, old houses into attractive low-income housing, bring people into the community who then are living and working there and spending their money and bringing in tax dollars. There are community development grants. Many communities have what's called a community foundation that's there to support development of the community. Those community development grants might go, for example, to a historic downtown organization that is going to work with all of the businesses to uh, help them maintain their storefronts to maintain the historic character. Maybe they'll all work together to pay for uh, historic wrought iron benches to be put downtown to bring that historic character back. So those are community development grants, and those are at the community level. There are local, state, and federal grants for the arts. and. In one of your books, there's some discussion of an opera house. Opera houses, theaters from the mid to late 19th century are absolutely beautiful structures. They often are in prominent locations in communities, and they are absolutely perfect for repurposing, but it's really expensive to do that. Arts grants are exactly meant to do that, because what you want to do with an art grant is bring arts into the community, you have a historic facility that could be used for that, and it's perfectly reasonable to say, fund the remodeling, renovation of this historic facility that will help bring arts into the community. There are transportation grants that help historic transportation hubs, stations, uh, and, and infrastructure, bridges, other things, um, to remain in a historic form but be repurposed for modern use. Transportation is a big issue, especially in urban places. People need to get from here to there. And by taking the existing transportation infrastructure, old stations, old bridges, and rehabilitating them, it saves money for everybody and helps to maintain the historic character of a community. And finally, there are conservation grants. And what I mean by that is, is ecological, environmental conservation grants. Because as we'll see in a moment, historic preservation does create sustainability, a sustainable community. And conservationists often don't want a community to expand out into the forest expand out into the agricultural fields. So to offset expanding and maybe destroying the, a natural uh, forest somewhere, conservation grants can be used to say, instead of building a new building and tearing, cutting down this forest and building a Menards there, which actually happened at the edge of, end of College Avenue here, um, we'll build it in another spot in a historic building and if you'll give us some grant to help pay for that additional cost, then you'll save your forest. We'll get the building we want, and we'll help the community. Everybody wins. And that's the whole purpose in the historic preservation economics. The idea is to have the developer make money, the community get tax income, and the community as a whole to end up better off. Okay, take another short break here. And now, music. The crab pizza is the pizza absolutely. Rusty Cray, yeah, 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 pizza is the pizza, yeah, for you and. And we 
are back. Okay, I want to spend just a few moments talking about sustainability. Sustainability is an important topic in historic preservation. I'm not giving it short shrift by only spending a few moments on it, but there's so much material in this course, I'm only going to spend a few moments on it. Sustainability is really one of the core benefits of historic preservation, and when we talk about economics, I don't think we can separate that from sustainability. How is historic preservation aid sustainability? Well, as this quote from one of your books puts it, the greenest building is the one that is already built. And there are some obvious reasons for that. One of them comes down to this concept of embodied energy. Everything in an existing building has potential energy in it. A brick has been taken from the ground and raised up and put in place. There's potential energy there just like you learned in high school physics. The brick comes and falls down and releases energy. But a human put it there. That human has been eating and it's their eating creates the fuel for them to have the energy to put that brick in place. That brick was baked in a fire. All the heat energy went into it to create that hard brick and before that, someone or some machine took a bunch of mud, mushed it together, and created the brick, which was then dried by the sun. You go all the way back, there's a lot of energy in a brick, energy that put the brick in place, and potential energy that still is in that brick sitting up on a wall. If you think about all that, the brick has a huge amount of embodied energy. And if we think of every brick in every building, that's a huge amount of stored energy. If we knock the building down and take the bricks to the dump, we've lost all that energy. And at a time when energy is very expensive and the forms of energy that we tend to use create other problems, climate change and pollution, well, maintaining that embodied energy and using it, or at least not letting it dissipate, is highly sustainable. The other thing that is very sustainable about particularly 19th century and earlier buildings, and 19th century are really the, the buildings I'm talking about here, is that they used very quality materials and construction. Um, when you get into some of the newer built houses, the McMansions, the ones that are put up quickly, there's what are called spec houses. You get in there and you'll see that a lot of the materials are not actually that high quality. Some of them, instead of being built with two by fours, are built with two by threes. Instead of being 16 inches on center, those the wall studs, they're 24 inches on center because all of that saves on um, on material costs and labor costs and helps to keep the price of the house or the building down and helps to increase profits for the builder. Older houses, like my house, have two by six studs in some of the walls. And they are full dimension, and we don't need to get into that, but a two by four is actually, um, two by four is one and a half by three and a half. It's not actually two by four. One's in my house, two by four. Um, studs are, are 16 inches on center. It's just simply much better constructed than a, a house similar that one might buy today. Windows in older houses are often beautifully put together. They're mortise and tendon together rather than uh, nailed together. The windows are fit individually into their pockets. Um, they're beautifully constructed because it was all handmade on site. Okay. That means that that building has a longer life in it than is often considered the life of a building today. In business today, one builds a building and one depreciates it over time, usually over the course of 30 years. 
which means that you expect that the useful lifespan of that building is about 30 years. And for some modern construction, that is reasonable. The building has not been built to last 50 or 100 years. It's been built to last 30 years. Many older houses, older factories, older uh, constructions weren't built with that in mind. They were built with the idea that they would last not forever, but for hundreds of years. And so the quality is really great. And you don't need to put as much construction and quality labor into those buildings. It's already there. If you know how to use it, if you have real historic preservation professionals doing the architecture, doing the design, doing the building, we'll talk some of, of that next time. The third thing is, with these quality materials and construction, there's a great conservation of resources. Some of the 19th century buildings still have old growth wood in them. Uh, they certainly have wood that was cut down 100 or more years ago. And if you can continue to use that, you're conserving those resources rather than taking that, putting it in the dump, cutting down more trees, and putting them back up. And we do have to think about landfills. Landfills are not sustainable. Um, eventually, you run out of places to put garbage. And although we think, we had hoped landfills would be places that over time uh, the, the garbage decays and becomes organic and settles and you can reuse that land again somehow, that's just not turning out to be the case. So. Uh, Garbage dumps are expensive. They're expensive for a community to operate. They're expensive in terms of the, in, of the energetics of them. And they stink in our eyesores. We don't like them around. Well, if we aren't sending things to the dump, then that saves all of that. So using the material that's there, repurposing a building, preserving what's already there, really does mean that the greenest building is the one that's already been built. All right. That's it for this week. We'll see you next time. Hello, it's Dr. Budelheimer here. I am going to sing you the Dr. Budelheimer song. Are you ready? It goes like this. Oh, Budelheimer, Budelheimer, clap, clap, clap. Budelheimer, Budelheimer, clap, clap, clap. The more you boodle, the less you heimer. The more you heimer, the less you boodle. Boodle heimer, boodle heimer, clap, clap, clap. Yay, wasn't that fun? And my monkey likes it too. You want to touch my monkey? No, 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 you cannot. He has coronavirus. Okay, I'll be the same shoes. Bye bye. Dormy.